Sorry, unfortunately. Yeah, because we're starting late. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our workshop. Sorry, we're starting slightly late, but we're hoping that we can bring a speaker in um, remotely uh, in this session. So, fingers crossed that's all set up now. Um, this is workshop 139 on refugees, digital rights, necessities, and needs. I'm Ian Brown from Research ICT Africa. I'm a, um, I'll be the moderator. Uh, we have three speakers here um, who will give opening statements and hopefully our also remote speaker. But we want to make this inter as interactive um, as possible, of course. We've asked our speakers to stick to five to 10 minutes maximum so that we have at least half the time, hopefully, uh, to bring you all in and hear your perspectives. So I will very quickly introduce the, the four speakers and then I will hand the floor to them. Um, firstly, with an introduction and a short statement about the relevant legal framework, we have Mohamed Farahat here, uh, who is from African Civil Society on the Information Society. Um, we then will have his colleague, uh, Dr. Sise Kane, who is president of, of this organization, um, who will talk a bit more about general issues and access and perspective in coming years. Then on my left, we have Shan Hong Hu, who is a program specialist at UNESCO's Division of Freedom of Expression, Media Development, Communication and Information Society, who will talk about UNESCO's work on digital rights, um, digital literacy and gender mainstreaming. And then finally, hopefully, we'll have Dr. Aaron Martin from Tilburg University, who will talk um, about um, refugees and privacy issues, and in particular, around bio the use of biometrics and SIM registration and the resulting impact on access. So um, let's get going. Mohammed. Uh, <clears throat> let me first so thank you all of you to uh, participate in this session. Uh, and I hope you get benefit from the discussion. Uh, the first, I would like to speak about the importance of uh, refugees' digital rights and uh, the, main, uh, the main aim of this session uh, simply to shed a light of uh, the importance of bringing uh, the refugees' digital rights uh, to the IGF agenda. And uh, if, you check, if you check the uh, IGF agenda, you will find only two sessions that speak <coughs> about the refugees. And the past years, we have, for example, IGF 2017, we don't have any sessions spoke about the refugees. So this is important. Uh, to know more about the, uh, to what extent the digital rights is important for refugees, we have to start by defining the, uh, what's the meaning of refugees. Uh, the main uh, key document that defines refugees is 1951 convention related to the refugee status. And they define refugees as a person who is outside his or her country of nationality, of nationality uh, or habitual uh, residence has well-founded fear of being persecuted because of his or her race, religion, nationality, membership of social political group, or political opinion, and is unable or unwilling to avail him or herself of the protection of that country. This is the definition of the refugees. If we speak about, our, or if we uh, focus in this definition, we find that the refugees is individual who forced to leave here or her country without our he leave uh, family and friends and loved person behind without any connection. So now, we, when you speak about the country, the host country of the refugees, if we see that this country, of course, the trends of countries who, or the policies of countries dealing with refugees is different from country to other. So if we speak or focus about these countries is adopt uh, restricted policies uh, for refugees, like if we speak about the, in the MENA region, maybe the access to internet is very, very, very limited. Uh, maybe the, pers the education, access to education is very, very limited. Uh, maybe this country put a, a very uh, high structure on family unification, so it's not easy for Rigi to bring his family to the host country. So, and also, if we speak about the right, uh, the right to association, maybe also this country put restriction to to assembly or try to assembly or to like set up an organization or. Uh, NGOs to discuss about their problems. In this time, so the, the, the digital rights or the access to internet be the last, last resort for this person to communicate, to gather, to discuss 
to express an opinion about many issues related to them, whether in the country of uh, origin or in the host country. Now, I will go briefly in my intervention about the legal framework. I will not, I will not operate in the legal framework of digital rights because I know that most of you are experts in this, or at least have uh, excellent uh, knowledge about the digital rights. So I will focus on, on some challenge, legal challenge, that face the refugee to access the right uh, digitally. Uh, the first, the first thing about the legal framework briefly that the all digital rights is recognized as human rights according to the many different uh, international, uh, international human rights law. If we speak about the ICPR or about uh, about other convention about international human rights uh, convention of uh, economic and social culture rights, but. I will focus on the Article 19 that is used to be uh, a cornerstone for the digital rights and especially for uh, right to expression, freedom of expression. Because uh, most of refugees, this based on this article, to, ex to express <coughs> their opinion or to communicate with others. Uh, the problem in this article is not binding article. Is not like the, the states is not binding by this article, and th they can do many restrictions or stop enjoying of freedom of expression. However, uh, also the second problem in digital rights for refugees, if we speak about 1951 Convention as a key legal document uh, dealing with the refugee issue, is this topic is not recognized in 1951 uh, one convention. No, we don't have any articles in any provision in 1951 convention that speak about the digital rights or access to information or access to internet. The third problematic is the government uh, or the government host majority of, of refugees have not enacted any domestic legislation uh, related to refugees. So this is also a main problem. Not on not only for the online rights, but only offline rights. Like most of countries in MENA, MENA regions don't have any legal uh, uh, documents re, uh, handle the situation of refugees. This is also a problem. Because in this situation from the legal side, the, all these refugees are treated as a foreign. And also there is a different, big difference between this person as foreigner and as refugees. Also, the, the last thing I will, uh, I will uh, finish it in one minute is that uh, I would like to move to, to speak also to other the legal challenges which related to impact of national digital crimes legislation on the international protection of refugees. As you know, that the, this legislation, in, especially in the, country, in the countries like MENA, uh, in MENA region, that they spot to restrict the digital rights. The, the, the Arab countries put this legislation to control the access to internet and access to digital rights in general. In this time, we have very, or this legislation has impact on in international protection. What is the meaning of the international protection for refugees? The main core of international protection for refugees to prohibit these countries from deporting these refugees. But according to this legislation, if the refugees like write something on Facebook, the country has a right according, under this legislation to deport this person and they use the pace or the, the reason of that this person is uh, considered uh, a threat on national security. So what is the national security? No of this legislation defines the national security. They have a, a, a full a absolute discretion to decide what is national security. For example, in Egyptian law, uh, they define the, define the national security as everything may be uh, if you speak about the military or uh, Ministry of Interior, this is considered national security and give the, the country a right to deport the refugees. Since this impact of national legislation or national digital crime uh, legislation on the international protections. 
To conclude my interventions briefly, I think it's extremely important to amend <coughs> the existing legal framework related to refugees, like, for example, the 1951 Convention. I see that we have to amend it and to uh, add some articles related to digital rights for refugees to at least making sure that as in, in the domestic level, if some person from refugees is subject to any uh, sort of deportation, we can use this article uh, as argument to stop the deportation. And also, <coughs> we need to uh, do adopting a binding legal instrument related to digital rights for refugees. And so my recommend, recommendation is to amend the existing legal framework, 1950 convention, to add articles related to digital rights for refugees, and also we have to <coughs> adopt new legal instrument uh, related to spe specifically to uh, digital rights for refugees. Thank you. Thanks, Mohammed, for that uh, very helpful introduction. Um, we will next go to Dr. Kane. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm very happy to be here. My name is Sise Khan. I am from Senegal. I am the chairman of uh, the African Civil Society on the Information Society. It's a platform of uh, uh, 500, uh, around 600 NGOs around the continent and throughout also the African diaspora. And we are uh, focusing on uh, ICT for development in general. And uh, we congratulate Mohammed from Egypt, Axis Egypt, who uh, uh, proposed this, uh, uh, this idea of workshop that has been accepted by the IGF. And uh, I will just uh, talk in a general sense about the issue. But I trust that there are uh, some more experienced people around the table and also the audience, uh, maybe, uh, to elaborate more. So the African Civil Society uh, on the Information Society axis is based in Senegal, and uh, we are operating throughout uh, our network of organizations and also people who are members. And uh, we have been uh, launched uh, in 2003 during the World Summit on the Information Society, and uh, we develop projects in uh, advocacy and uh, sensitizing uh, on uh, various issues related to internet and the ICTs, uh, like uh, access, like also the threats of, uh, uh, of the internet, also uh, training about uh, <coughs> internet access, and also advocating for uh, the, the issues of affordability and uh, linguist di linguistic <coughs> diversity and uh, also uh, local localization of uh, of uh, the process of the internet and also local uh, local cultures and languages so if you go uh, throughout our website uh, you can see what <coughs> what we are doing we are present in many of the debates and uh, our members are uh, participating in, uh, in the general debates and also we have participated in uh, this internet universality project <coughs> that has been uh, launched by UNESCO. We even applied and uh, we continue to, to contribute throughout our members. Uh, regarding uh, uh, the issue of refugees and, uh, and, in, uh, and their rights, we consider that uh, um, there is an ongoing debate between uh, 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 the relationship between uh, the rights online and the rights offline. And uh, we, we think that uh, all the rights uh, offline should be also implemented online because the societies are really moving very fastly uh, into the, the, the digital transformation. And uh, there is no uh, time uh, to waste uh, to make uh, these rights offline matching with the, the new reality. And everybody is now having a smartphone and having a, uh, is connected. And uh, there are lots of uh, new rights that should be really taken into account. And we call upon the specialists uh, on, of the issue to really tackle the issue of the rights online, because uh, it's moving very fast. And uh, we cannot just ignore it. 
and also if, when it comes to refugees in general, uh, we consider that they are human beings and uh, that uh, um, all the rights uh, that are for human beings should be also for them. And uh, the only thing uh, which is really complicating the issue is that uh, refugees are all, all, very often um, displaced people and uh, they don't always live in uh, the best conditions. And uh, may, sometimes maybe uh, talking about internet could be maybe a, a luxury because sometimes they don't have water, clean water, they don't have toilets, they don't, can, cannot settle and uh, they don't have links with their uh, country of origin and they don't uh, express themselves. Sometimes they are just put in jail because of... So, and also we see that in some countries, uh, even the, the soldiers who were meant to, to protect them, they are raping the girls and they are pu putting pressure and giving money and exploiting them. So they are facing lots of threats. And uh, beyond uh, the issue of ICT and the uh, digital issue, we should, to, we should really uh, help um, to, to, to raise uh, these, uh, these uh, big threats that are facing. And maybe one of the best ways is uh, to use the ICT as a mean to, to seize, to, to wait on the, on the processes to make them having uh, their own rights in all uh, aspects. And uh, you know, in Africa, uh, Africa is one of the most, uh, uh, one of the continent where we have most of refugees. 26% uh, of the world's refugees population are Africans. And uh, we ha you have wars in uh, many, many countries. We have refugees in, uh, in, in, in uh, Sudan, in Ethiopia, in Uganda. Cameroon, Chad, Egypt, Egypt also, uh, and uh, yeah, we are giving uh, employment to the UNHCR, to the old organizations, so they should also uh, think about how they can really uh, uh, to help fulfilling their, 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 their rights, and we think that uh, the digital issue can be a uh, sort of a raccourci to help them uh, to tackle uh, their uh, major challenges. Um, also, uh, there is a, um, um, the issue is so critical that uh, um, the African <coughs> Union, uh, uh, my organization is a member of the African Union Civil Society um, um, uh, body, which is the Economic, Social and Cultural uh, uh, Council of the African Union. And uh, I am happy to inform you that the, the year 2019 will be uh, the year of uh, the, return, the refugees, returnees, and internally displaced persons. Uh, so we are going to, to organize lots of debates and also lots of uh, uh, actions uh, around uh, the issue of re refugee. And uh, that's why we are expecting to have really good recommendations from this workshop so that we can bring it to the African Union and uh, we can uh, voice for the refugees at the, the political level at the African Union because we are, um, at the ECOSOC, we are working on ICT issues and I am in charge of uh, the ICT component of the ECOSOC. So which year was that? ECOSOC is the uh, next year, 2019, starting 1st of January. It will be the year of <coughs> refugees. That, that shows how uh, we are really uh, re concerned by the issue of uh, refugees and internally displaced persons. And also, uh, to finish on that, uh, we have two components. Uh, the first component is the, the refugees in Africa. So displaced person from a country to another, from a region to another. But we also have uh, the refugees uh, from Africa outside of Africa. And uh, maybe uh, we can look it also at, at this aspect at a, in a positive way, because uh, most of them are, uh, uh, in some countries, they are uh, living in better conditions, and they are uh, going to school, and they are um, making uh, progress in all their education. And uh, we see that uh, recently, uh, a refugee who were living in a camp in Kenya a few years ago, she became a congresswoman in the U.S. Mm -hmm. She is from Somalia.
And, and this is a, a good example on how uh, we can uh, help uh, these people because they are just human beings and they just want to live a normal life. How we can help them? And uh, if uh, coming back to the digital, and I finish there, I think the rights are uh, the same uh, than in other all countries in Africa, which is the, the access, access to ICT, access to internet, but also. Um, <coughs> The, the cost of internet is very, uh, very, uh, very heavy for them. Sometimes they don't even have a penny uh, to have connection, and they need to be uh, in touch with their country of origin or their region of origin. Uh, also, um, uh, the, the issue of uh, access to local languages and to local contents, sometimes uh, they are just lost in this... Uh, <coughs> this panorama uh, because uh, they are disconnected with all their, uh, uh, all these are normally uh, also digital rights as they are human beings. So I think uh, UNESCO has been doing a, a great job on these issues and uh, I think that there is a need uh, really to come up with uh, more concrete uh, proposals and solutions to um, they really uh, put it on the table of uh, the politicians and also uh, the decision makers. And uh, just uh, to finish uh, on that, uh, we are uh, a network. We are uh, present in almost all of the African continent and on the diaspora. And uh, we are ready to voice for these uh, the refugees' rights. We are ready to accompany the, the UNESCO, but also all uh, partner organizations and to, to make uh, this year, 2019, uh, successful. And we are waiting uh, also for your proposals uh, to, to get this done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cissé, and, and also to Mohammed for um, being so concise. Um, Shan Hong. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Xian Hong from here, UNESCO. Welcome all of you to the house, and I wish you enjoy every day here in the discussion. Thank you so much for bringing up the uh, crucial issue of refugees to the Internet Policy Forum. Yeah, it's my first time to encounter this issue. And also thank you for your organization's contribution to UNESCO's project on the Internet Universality Project. I remember how I met you, Mohammed, in, in, in Egypt when they said that UNESCO want to advocate uh, internet universality principles. We advocating four fundamental <coughs> principles. Internet should be developed according to uh, human rights based, uh, should be accessible by all, should be, uh, should be open, uh, should be driven by the multi-stakeholder participation. I, I do think that all these four principles should apply to refugees equally as to anybody uh, in the world. Like uh, at the UN level, have you know you have known that we have reached the global consensus to do to achieve the sustainable development goals. We want to leave no one behind. I mean that's all what we are here about. So. I'm not an uh, expert on refugees, but uh, I've been working on digital rights for years. I mean, uh, since the U United Nations Human Rights Council uh, endorsed a very important uh, resolution in 2012, we interpret the digital rights from the uh, angle of international human rights framework, that, uh, which means that all the human rights as uh, endorsed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights <coughs> should be equally applied offline as online. Um, well, this year happened to be the 70 years anniversary of the, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I mean, we are celebrating the Human Rights Day on 10th of December as well, so may, that may also be an occasion we should really uh, think about these issues. Uh, in specific to the digital rights, um, as I mentioned that UNESCO recent position on the universality uh, <clears throat> we had a core mandate in our constitution to defend the freedom expression, and after 2015, uh, our member states endorsed a new uh, position to uh, address the internet governance, uh, which, as I mentioned, is 
called the Internet Universality with those four uh, principles. So by human rights-based approach, we have identified uh, a number of key rights we think should be highlighted in the e internet ecosystem. I think that's uh, equally applied to refugee situation. Um, I recently saw news that when uh, when the refugee came to a country, um, yes, they first asked for uh, water, shelter, but then they also asked for a mobile phone, asked for a Wi-Fi, asked for a connection. You can imagine how ICT and internet are being so central to satisfy their basic need and also to the, to strengthen their well-beings. And by human rights online, I mean digital age, we said that, uh, I mean, we have identified five or six key areas. We know human rights is really uh, so broad. First one, freedom, freedom expression. Uh, it's not a luxury. I think it's, it's equally essential, essential as the food and the water uh, for refugees as well. And second one is freedom of information, which means access to the governmental information, to public health information. That's a right for citizens, but uh, shouldn't we also have it for the individuals, for the people um, in the fragile, in a vulnerable situation like refugees. And uh, third, uh, a dimension about the privacy. Uh, privacy, I, I know we have, we're having a great expert on that. I mean, privacy and personal data protection it's, it's became a crucial issue impacting dignity of everybody in the digital age. And then we look at uh, <clears throat> The freedom of association as a right to how everybody, individual, can engage in the public life, in, in the public policy making, uh, equally essential for the refugees. Um, lastly, we look at a broader dimension of uh, economic, uh, social, and the cultural rights of everybody in digital age. Uh, since we are now living on internet, we couldn't live without it. Uh, so it's a part of our everyday life, uh, the right to education, right, <coughs> right to uh, participating in the culture life. Uh, I saw you are looking at me. I'm, I'm almost not finishing. Uh, in addition to this rights-based approach, um, as our colleague just mentioned about the access. I mean, connectivity, the cost, affordability, uh, they are all covered by the universality principles of, uh, in terms of access. By accessing not just uh, the infrastructure, you cannot uh, just give them a mobile phone, they can get everything. <coughs> you also need to think about the quality of the access. If they are uh, relevant, uh, useful content uh, uh, to them, and also look at the language issue. Uh, uh, again, um, capacity, I mean the literacy, internet uh, ICTs are also developing on a daily basis and social media platforms, uh, artificial intelligence and blockchains, they are changing, they are giving our new opportunities and also threats on a daily basis. I think we also keep these people, I mean, to be educated, informed to, with the latest <coughs> skills to make sure that uh, they are equally benefiting from the development of uh, ICTs. Very last point I want to point out is the gender divide and the children issue, which are always at my heart at UNESCO's mandate. We have the, in this framework, we, ha we are mainstreaming the gender divide issues. I mean, uh, I don't know if you have statistics among the refugee community, uh, uh, the difference between <coughs> women, women and the men, their access and their use of the ICT. Uh, maybe they are having maybe more, even more, more barriers to that uh, equally, I mean, children, well, they are always in a position to be to be empowered with these digital skills and to be safe. So I stop here and look forward to more uh, discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you, Shang, Shang Kong, also for being concise. And I know also you have a, a meeting tomorrow at four. Oh, yeah. Is that right? If um, if people are interested in finding out more about UNESCO's work. Please come along. Um, okay, now, Aaron has been patiently watching us from the screen. Um, Aaron, have you heard everything? I've heard. Perfect. Um, you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you, wonderful. So, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, good afternoon everyone. And I'm sorry I couldn't be in um, these things happen. Uh, I want to thank one of the pressing issues I'm glad we're here to discuss. A little bit about myself, so you know who I am and, and why I'm uh, on the panel, and then I'll uh, dive into a specific issue around um, access to mobile connectivity and, and financial services. So, 
I'm a postdoc at the Tilburg Institute for Law, Technology, and Society. Uh, at this institute, I work with Leonard Taylor, Professor Leonard Taylor, on an ERC project uh, focused on global data justice. And we're aiming to make the case for connecting digital rights and freedoms globally, which I think is relevant to today's discussion. My focus is on humanitarian data and the ethical issues related to both personal and non personal data that arise. Cybersecurity risk. Um, I'd like to note that UNHCR is in the process of refreshing its connectivity for refugee strategy uh, to make it more rights based, uh, for example, by looking at connectivity as a human right. This is work in progress, uh, and I'd, I'd like you all to keep an eye on their website for further updates and, and activity around the strategy. Now, today I'd like to discuss a related topic, which is how legal and regulatory frameworks uh, and requirements therein for providing identity and proof of identity for obtaining a SIM card or opening a bank account have created barriers to access in, in different ways. So these are different legal and regulatory frameworks than those that we'll have to discuss, but I think they're nonetheless quite important. To give you a sense of the scale,
Thanks, Aaron. That's great. So we've had, I think, from our speakers, a really good uh, introduction, um, a look at um, the, the relevant legal framework, um, broader, inf broader issues of um, refugee rights, um, a number of ideas on ways that the situation could be improved. So UNESCO's work on Internet Universality One, a number from Aaron uh, of mentions of work by uh, UNHCR, by GSMA and others. So we have 15 minutes left in our session um, and it's time to bring everyone else in. Um, could I ask you please for our uh, moderator's sake that you say um, your name and your affiliation at the start of your intervention. Um, you're welcome to give a, a, a concise uh, comment if you wish, if you could keep that perhaps to, to 30 to 60 seconds please so everyone can get a chance um, and to ask a question. If you have a question, could you please um, indicate which of the four speakers you are putting your question to just so that we have the, the best opportunity for everyone who would like to get involved to do so. Could you help me by putting your hand up if you have a comment or a, a question that you would like to make? So we've got, we've immediately got two. That's a good start. So please. Um, good afternoon. Pinder Wong from Hong Kong. Um, I just want to make a, an observation with respect to, I think, Mohammed's opening comments on the legality of it, because legal identity has been the, one of the common themes which really harks back to kind of a Westphalian view, you know, from 1648. I think there is a new tool in the toolbox, and I think uh, 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 Shang Hong uh, and also Aaron mentioned um, blockchain technologies and tokenization. I think there is a new tool in the toolbox, and that is to recognize that these displaced persons and these refugees who seek uh, legal identity might have an alternative. In other words, they may not have legal certainty, but they may have cryptographic certainty. So in the digital realm, in the space of Bitcoin, which I've been playing with for the last sort of three or four years, i.e. this new edge technology, there is a new tool in the policy toolbox, commonly called blockchain, but we, more pragmatically, it's the ability to use a cryptocurrency to engender economic activity. So it's not just an issue of asking for handouts. And so the suggestion here, specifically to the observation for next year in Africa, is to really start thinking about livelihood and the right to work. Why? Because mother, sort of necessity is the mother of invention. These people are probably gonna be the most creative um, in the world, uh, almost by necessity. And so if we provide them digital tools, they will be able to empower themselves and work digitally. So the right to work digitally is something that I would feel passionate about. I think cryptocurrencies uh, enable that, but I think there's a very, very limited window where, for example, a authorized cryptographic currency versus vis-a-vis -vis some of the other ones, um, there is this window before all this stuff becomes underground because the tools already exist. So therefore, tool provision to enable them to provide cryptographic, the use of cryptographic currencies so that they have the ability to work and the right to work online is something that I would suggest that uh, the African Union look at. Thank you. Thank you, Pinda. Marianne, could I ask you to use a mic, please, for the remote um, participants? Maybe he, he, there's one here. Yeah, anyone, just to press yeah the that's it. Oh, hi, Mary Ann Franklin, Internet Rights and Principles Coalition. Uh, thanks for this a very important panel. Um, refugees have specific rights under international law. Refugees also have human rights under international law. So my question is, how is it possible that refugees, asylum seekers, displaced persons, and newcomers find simple things such as access to the web, uh, the ability to be able to use their mobile phones? Why are these things taken away from them? when they have the misfortune, and I call it the misfortune of finding themselves in detention centers or a removal centers, how is it possible that they are, uh, that their rights as refugees and as human beings are subtracted away from by virtue of their situation? I'd like a concrete answer from any government and also any technical community people here, please. Thank you. Also, just <laughs> while I've got the floor, um, the second part of this uh, theme will be continuing at 9 o'clock on Wednesday morning with our refugees and rights. So thank you very much, panel. Thanks, Marianne. Since Marianne asked a very specific question before I go back to the panel, is there, is there anyone from a, a, gov a national government or intergovernmental organization um, or from the technical community that would like to, to respond to Marianne's point? Anybody? Maybe, to, maybe, at your, maybe at your meeting, Marianne, they will meet your, your challenge. Um, Let the question stand, then, on the record. <laughs> um, 
which of our panellists would like to come back on the first, po first point? Okay, sorry. Bowser, well, I actually would, uh, I would mean to mention that uh, it's supposed that we have someone from Egyptian government to speak about the livelihoods. So the livelihood component, it was supposed to one of our uh, uh, sessions component to discuss, but unfortunately the speaker has excused in the last time. So I, I agree with you, the livelihood and trust work is very, very important in the digital rights or to sh make sure that the refugees has access to internet and access to digital rights have a, a, a big impact on uh, the livelihood uh, issues related to refugees because if we speak about the, like, uh, the refugees, if they, in some countries they don't have access to work because they need work permit and the government don't give the refugees a, a work permit. So last resort for these refugees to make some work through the internet. And actually this happened now in Egypt. Egypt don't allow to refugees to work uh, uh, legally. So they now start to make some <coughs> their own work uh, through internet and they have some Facebook pages to announce about their, uh, their work. So I agree with you on that. And also I would like to relate, relate this by, uh, with the, the, my colleague here mentioned about the gender because you know most of the, the women refugees don't have access to internet and this, there is some states by name are they mentioned that only I, as a member to present of women has access to refugees, access, uh, refugees women have access to internet. So uh, most, for experience in Egypt, most of African uh, refugees in, e in Egypt are uh, women, not men, uh, with children, without the husband. So I think ensure or make sure that they have access to internet and we give them some resolution about uh, to solve the uh, language barriers. I think it will be good to uh, make some work and earn some money to, to leave. That's it. Great. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, who would like to come in, please? Sorry, I'm not commenting, <laughs> but I was just uh, making a submission. Um, maybe I came in a bit late. Maybe it was addressed. Um, my name is Lilian Naroga. I'm from Uganda. Um, on the issue, I know I've heard about the rights issues, you know, having access to information, connect to family and all that. Um, but just wondering, because in many cases, um, uh, on the issue of refugees is there's the issue of cost, access to the devices themselves. There are times that uh, when refugees go into a place, their devices are confiscated. Uh, away from that, but there's also the issue of... Uh, having money to buy the gadgets themselves and also connecting, you know, buying, having money to connect this. And um, probably someone may have mentioned it from the submissions earlier. How, my question is, has there been in any sort of engagements to work with uh, service providers to provide any sort of, you know, discounts to mobile phones themselves but also to the internet because I also think I, I think that this could be one way of making life a little bit more easier and friendlier to have some sort of subsidized uh, uh, cost or fees to you know have access to these connectivity gadgets. Great, thank you. I wonder, Aaron, if you would like to come in because I know you've worked in the past with telcos and you mentioned DSMA. that would uh, help groups. I, I know China, I don't want to um, misstate the, the country, but I know for sure UNHCR on occasion has done this. Uh, it was somewhere in the Middle East. It was either Jordan or Lebanon. I can, I can get the specifics for you soon, but they, because it's quite expensive mobile connectivity there and that cost was one of the major barriers. They've essentially negotiated a, a refugee plan. I hate to, I hate to use the, the label, but um, it provides a much more cost effective access to to, uh, to groups there. Just, then just uh, like a recommendation or about the, uh, how to solve the, the connectivity issue and the price the cost to access to internet for refugees. I think one of uh, maybe the solution for that if we choose that maybe UNCR in cooperation with the, govern the host uh, country governments if we set up some like uh, 
some center centers f uh, that offer the, the service free for refugees. I will maybe solve the problem. If we speak about the like access to education, maybe the students, or we can say that e education centers for, for students, for refugees, you can access to this place uh, without any charge. And also for livelihood, maybe also make some uh, like cyber nets uh, <coughs> shops for, or centers, uh, especially for refugees to, uh, they have access to this without paying any, 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 any money for that. I think maybe solve the problem or to cope with the, the problem of the cost. So, thank you. Thank you. I think, as, as I said earlier, there is a le also the level of priority uh, for some of, uh, for most of these refugees, uh, they don't have even a uh, place to just to, uh, to sleep. Sometimes uh, food is a, a problem. So, and also the issue of the country where they are living is, is important. Whether it is a, a wealthy country, where it is a developing country, uh, there may be uh, some priorities uh, to, to check. And, uh, but I am hopeful that uh, ICT as a, uh, as a tool can be maybe a way to ease their life. For example, uh, uh, I, I like your, your proposals about uh, the displaced persons in, in Africa. And I think uh, if there are some, some solutions, uh, we are open and we can uh, talk at a, at a decision-making level. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, we have four minutes left. I know we have one question here. Any, anyone else want to make a, a last-minute short intervention? Two and then three. Okay, so we'll take all three and then we'll have final words from the panel, if that's okay, please. Uh, Edmund Chung from Dot Asia. Um, I'm, I'm very supportive of, of the discussion and, and I hear with a lot of interest, but I, I have a, I guess a more, maybe a stupid or a question. Um, I, I may have come in a bit late and missed it. I, I understand this is a part of, part of rights, but how, like I'm sure many countries and, and jurisdictions have protocols for handling refugees. How many of those have connectivity in those protocols at this point? And I, the question, I, the reason why I ask this is, where is the fight right now? Is it to get the governments to adopt this as part of the protocol for, for dealing with re refugees, or is that already in? And it's a matter of uh, economics to, to, to implement it. So I don't know whether that has been answered. No, it hasn't, and that's a great question. <coughs> Please. Oh, hi, I'm Faith Lee. I'm also, I'm a youth representative from Dot Asia organization. So to add on to um, a point that was raised just now, um, so I think that it would be crucial for government, orga government, um, government intergovernmental organizations as well as these um, service providers to work together in order to um, provide more welfare and um, for these refugees um, to um, increase the connectivity, which they currently have very limited access to. So I was wondering whether or not it would be possible to perhaps, um, or are there any specific ways to provide the, um, this kind of welfare to them? For example, could you perhaps distribute bandwidth or could you perhaps create a, a, a refugee-specific channel for them to have access to? and or maybe create a local community network. So actually, I'm aware that there is a network in place called Loon. So it's essentially designed to bring internet connectivity to rural and remote communities worldwide. But then obviously, um, one project like this might not be adequate to cover um, such a global issue. So I was just wondering, what are the specific ways to make this kind of welfare happen. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, um, again, Pinderbong from Hong Kong again. A uh, suggestion um, for, I think labels matter. And although we refer to them as internally displaced or refugees or economic migrants, I would like to suggest for this group, since it is sort of digitally focused, um, to consider the following, which is I refer to everyone as being uh, netizen expatriates, net expats. Right. Why? Because we've already moved 4 billion people online in the last 20 years and no one seemed to have noticed. Right. So digital, you know, in the digital realm, it's space enough for everyone. 
And so if we begin with, in, in some sense, the digital space or the netizen space and view them as sort of netizen expatriates, I mean, there are a group of people who travel the world with a bag and a phone, with multi-banked and multi-currency, and, and they do that. And so if we turn, take a more positive view that they can contribute to every d uh, domestic economy, and again, I suggest to you consider the term netizen expatriate. Thank you. Thank you for that. So we're already overrunning. So what I want to do to very quickly wrap up is I'll go to each of our speakers. If they would like to respond to the two questions or the final statement, great. Um, if you have any immediate closing thoughts, but I think people will start coming in the door in the next couple of minutes. Um, so let's be quick. So I'll go in the same order as they spoke. So uh, Mohammed, please. So only thing I would like to say in the end of this session that the digital rights is a solution for the problems that refugees already faced uh, uh, in the fact, because if we speak, they face a problem to get access to education, access to health care, uh, access to work. So the only solution now, the digital rights. So I'm, I would like to stress in this. We have to ensure that and to uh, make sure that they have access to these rights to solve the problem of uh, access to their offline in host countries. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think the the digital rights of refugees are um, just uh, 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 an anchoring point and, uh, and a big uh, um, um, uh, a bigger problem, a more problem, a uh, plus problem. They have more uh, specific needs. They have more uh, priorities to live and to to be uh, in a good situation of uh, livelihood and uh, maybe sometimes just to have something to eat. And that uh, we have already uh, uh, rules for human beings about internet, about access. We can use the same rules, but that that means that there there are uh, some um, good. Uh, solutions in uh, every country because a refugee is first a uh, human being. Thank you. Uh, th thank you so much. I learned a lot from all of you. I, I, I think, yeah, we should uh, think about how we can mainstream the digital rights, or human rights aspect to the, those international policies or legal frameworks, but also in the heart about the national protocols about re refugees, as uh, Adam mentioned. And plus, I think uh, uh, digital rights should not be violated and should, be not, should not be isolated from considering the, the internet and um, digital age as an entirety. I mean, we should also look at how we enable this rights by, by promoting access, right, content, um, gender equality, children empowerment, as well as the, um, I mean, as I'm still looking at the renovate approach of governance called a multi-stakeholder approach. I was in a session this morning and someone said, ah, it's not working, but I would say that this should be working also for solving the refugee issues. Look, I mean, everybody can offer a solution. When I'm from a technical community, we can offer a technical solution. And from the IGOs, we can offer a legal and regulatory framework and options, policy options. And national governments, I mean, NGOs, civil societies, and academia, I mean, they all have a role here. To, to play when it's a shared responsibility and also we need the expertise and um, resources I'm sorry and service providers I mean they could ma provide some immediate solution I mean refugees are living in such a tight uh, situation to be uh, to, I mean to be empowered so I do um, I promote uh, I think the multi stakeholder approach to be one on the agenda for, for the future to engage actors uh, on the table to to create more synergies and to supporting this refugee issue. Again, thank you for advertising our event tomorrow at the 4 p.m. room 10. We can already continue some part of discussion here. Thank you. Great, thank you, Chan Hong. And Aaron? Thanks, Ian. Um, I'll be very brief. I just want to say that these are very complicated issues, and um, I'd be very sort of cautious of any easy solutions. Refugees are just one population, uh, among others, asylum seekers, internally displaced persons, returnees, uh, stateless people, uh, they all present um, you know, very complex uh, realities and, and, and we need to account for all of those different groups and, and the sort of specifics of their, 
their situations as we think through these issues of digital rights. Thank you all. Great. So thank you again to our speakers, to everyone that's come along and contributed, and I hope that um, in 2019 we can meet in Berlin and discuss lots of activity um, that uh, improves these situations. Thank you. Thank you.